Right then, let's get down to uh, business. It is a real pleasure to introduce this man. Um, here he is at some football. I'm afraid so. Um, we stand Ian up is, for this. Ian is a, a poet <coughs> and a broadcaster, that's how I've kind of referred to him um, here. Although I'm not sure that kind of really does um, Ian justice, because you've done a lot of stuff. You, Lots you, of different things, yes. You, you host the firm on the <coughs> three, 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 yeah. Three, yeah. All manner of TV shows, you've even narrated adverts on Don't Have Yes, I have. Yeah, quite an honour. Um, and um, he's even been the guest on Desert Island Discs. Oh, no. One of his choices was Donald Wears Your Trousers. Right. So classic. True story. Classic, exactly. <laughs> Eight um, times, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, stories, finding, mining, believing, presenting, <coughs> and joining them. Please welcome Ian Thank you very much. <laughs> So, I do feel a bit of a fraud in here because you all tell stories all the time and that's the great thing about local radio, that it actually reflects a place's culture back to itself and it's doing that more and more. So what I want to do is just talk a bit about uh, the kind of stories that I tell and how I do them and then we're going to make up together an interactive epic using the flip chart. Yes, I knew that would excite you. And then we're going to do something else. Um, the thing I like about stories is that they kind of remind you who you are as a human being and who you can become. And that's why I love it when they introduce you. And they've got Ian Macmillan, that's a great moment. It's by, part of the reason we like being in public. And they've got Ian Macmillan, here's your name, it's fantastic. It can backfire, because as a poet, I visit a lot of schools. And recently, I went to a school in Newark, because uh, they've got one now. And they rang me up, some places don't get that long, I won't name names, uh, Chesterfield. They rang me up, and they said, we're going to meet you off the train at Newark Northgate Station at half past nine. I said, right. So I got off the train, and there's only me got off, and there's one person waiting. And I thought, well, she's come to meet me. So I went up to her and I said, hello, in a friendly fashion, as you do. And she looked straight through me. I thought, oh, sorry, this is the wrong person. And I'm stood there looking nervous. And she stood there looking at her watch. And I thought, well, she's obviously come to meet me. So I went up to her and I said, are you expecting Ian Macmillan? And she went, yes. And I said, it's me. And she went, oh. <laughs> that was her exact word. Oh, and she looked me up and down, like my mum does. And she went, you're nothing like your photo. I said, oh, well, it's an old picture, can't be helped. And she went, we're getting the car. And we're going towards the school. And she's going, I can't get over. I look at you like your photo. I said, no, well. And then she said, you can't drive, can you? And I said, no. And she said, how do you get about? I said, buses and trains. She said, yes, but surely you must have to fly quite a lot. I said, well, not from Newark to Barnsley, no. <laughs> she didn't laugh, which is a bad sign. As we were brought in the school, I wish I was making this up. As we were brought in the school, she went, look, I'm introducing you to the kids. Let's just get this straight before you start. How many novels have you written? And I said, none. And she said, that explains it. And we get in the school, there's a big photograph for somebody else. And he says, welcome, Ian Macmillan. She went, that's not you. I said, no. She said, that explains it. She kept saying, that explains it. It turns out there's another Ian Macmillan who's an American novelist and she thought I was him. And she got this book out there and she went, you didn't write this? I said, no. She said, that explains it. Because on the back, it says, Ian Macmillan teaches at the University of Hawaii. And she said, we come work out how you taught in Hawaii and lived in Barnsley. I said, yes. It's at least three buses, you have to change it by gate. And she said, the trouble is, all the kids have read your book and they've got some questions to ask. I said, it's all right, I'll answer them. It was the best half out of my life. They say things like, how long does it take to write a book? I'm saying, 20 minutes. And they say, what are they about? I'm saying, cheese, if you look hard enough. And that's an example of a bad start. And another thing that happened to me quite recently about the story of you know, not knowing who you are, this school in Cheshire rang up. They said, look, we've had a competition. The prize is you're going to come along and do some poems. I said, right. They said, we're very excited that you're coming. I said, right. They said, Mrs. Smith, the music teacher, has written a fanfare on the piano. When we introduce you, she's going to play. I said, right. Also, the recorder group have learnt the fanfare. I said, right. So I got there and went very excited. She went, boys and girls, please welcome one of Brin's leading poets. Please welcome Mr. Ian Bland. There was a terrible silence. No one went, woo, on the piano. And I says, I'm not Ian Bland. She went, who are you? I went, Ian Macmillan. She went, never heard of him. I said, well, who's Ian Bland? She had never heard of him either. She said, it just says, the very time she said Ian Bland, the woman played the thing on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> he, he kept saying, yeah. So she said, it says Ian Bland on the letter. The thing is, on the letter, it says Ian Macmillan. That's just strange. So I said, look, if I were called Ian Bland, I'd change my name to Ian Exciting or Ian Dynamic. Then, and then I got home, and it turned out that actually is something called Ian Bland. Do you want to see it, you? It feels like I'm being uh, in, interrogated. <laughs> just there's a bit nervous from the behind you. So, <laughs> so it, that was, that's an example of uh, not quite knowing who you are. <clears throat> the other thing is, I think what we're talking about today, is this example of, we're thinking about communication, because I think storytelling, you know this as much as me, more than me, storytelling is communication and actually doing it properly. And what I like about this event is that we know what we're doing, and we know exactly what we're doing, we know what the timings are. But sometimes, you'll all have done events, you'll have been to stuff, 
where you don't know what's happening and it's all wrong and that, that's where we've got to get the storytelling right. The most bizarre thing I ever did, I once got rung up, somebody rang up from Domestos. He said, oh, we, re we represent Domestos. Can you write a poem about Domestos? I said, yes. He said, can it be a sonnet? I said, yes, it can. He said, can it, can it include the phrase, champagne of the smallest room? I said, yes. I wrote this poem. He said, can you come down to London at half past seven in Leicester Square and read it from a giant wooden toilet? I said, yes, I can. <laughs> so, because as you know, I always say yes. That always leads to excitement. When people say, I'm going freelance, I don't know what to do. I said, when somebody rings you up, always say yes, because it leads to excitement. Sometimes it might not work, it doesn't matter. So, I get down to Leicester Square, I've got my poem. They gave me a new, a new version of my poem, framed. I said, all right, so I stood there with the poem. I said, shall I get in the giant wooden toilet now? He said, no, it's all right, because the papers and the television and the radio aren't here yet. So I'm stood there with me thing. A tiny woman, about the size of a pepper pot, coming and stood next to me like that, with a big calibre. And all right, she stood there like a big calibre. And they said, shall I get in the toilet? But no, you're all right. And then we were annoyed that you will have these, when you've worked with PR firms, it's been a PR disaster, where the ones they said are coming aren't coming. So the PR firm stood there, they were going, uh, Channel 4 aren't coming. BBC Two aren't coming. Two counties radio can't make it. Nobody's coming. Eventually it dawned on them and on me that nobody was coming. It was a PR disaster. Then some blokes got out of the van, dismantled the toilet, took it away. I stood there with my poem under my arm. The little woman who turned out was one of the CEOs of Domestos. She says, she says, I said, I'm sorry about that. She went, it's not your fault. Then she went, anyway, I write poems. I said, oh, good. And her carry bag were full of poems. So me and her had to sit there in this Costa Coffee all morning reading poems. That was a terrible moment. But anyway, that was a moment of non-communication. So, let me show you some examples of publicity I've had that haven't been as good as today, where we know what we're doing. I did a performance at Melton Mowbray Library. So I do all the hotspots. It was part of the Melton Mowbray Comedy Festival. That was a long weekend. And this was their entire publicity. Funny poet here. <laughs> I got there, I said, is that it? They said, no, there's one on the back door as well. I said, oh, no. <laughs> and three people turned up. And one of them said, oh, we thought it might be you. I said, yes, that's the power of advertising. In fact, my smallest audience ever was minus two. That's how I've been up for two. If you go up the M1 to Torrington Services, at the back of there, there's the village of Torrington. There's a pub there called the Sow and Pigs, where the Torrington Poetry Society meet. And I was their guest point. And I got there, and there were two people in the audience, and they were the organisers. And they said, what happens is, we read our poems first, then you do yours. I said, right. But they read theirs and went on. They said, we'd like to stay. I said, and so I thought, I'd show you a few of these. This is, uh, this is from Lincoln, Lincoln Central Library. Old fashioned desk at the front of this really weird notice. You think, well, just handwritten notice just says, we do not supply washing up liquid. You think, well, what kind of library is that? <laughs> Two Catherine Cooks, there's a bottle of squeezy, please. And I said to a woman, can I have that notice? She said, I'll have to make another one. I said, that's all right, in your own time. I've always lived in a place called Darfield, not far from Barnsley. If you go from Darfield towards Huddersfield, you pass the wonderfully named village of Skelmanthorpe, known locally as Shat, because they used to be stone shatterers. There's actually a taxi firm in Skelmanthorpe called Shat Taxis, which sounds like some terrible disease. But last time I was there, I was in a chip shop, there's a girl behind the counter with a tattoo that said Rosie from Shat, and she's coming later on. And this is their code of conduct. Skelmanthorpe Youth Centre is fantastic. Go to Conan. No bullying, no smoking, no alcohol, no drugs, no fighting, no antisocial behaviour, no stealing, no swearing. Respect everybody. Speak to staff members if you've got any worries. Elke Youth Club Tiny. Pay your subs. Respect the building. Football on the football court only. Have fun. This <laughs> 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 is a different colour. It's in green. Have fun. Fantastic. People say, what's it got to do with storytelling? Well, it has, because I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of addicted to these things as you are, just these little tiny things that can make a tale, that can make a story. I found this in a school in Wakefield, it's unfathomable. Just said, do not trip over the feet. Don't tell you which feet, just don't trip over, just do not trip over the feet. Don't trip over. I found this in a church in Norfolk. What I like about this is it's very prescriptive. It just says, please place nothing on this piano. Not, do not place anything on this piano, but go and get some nothing and put it on the piano. Good job it with Norfolk, some say, but not me. I, some of them are very strange. I found this one. You know, sometimes somebody's lost a dog or a cat and they put a notice on a tree or a lamppost. I was down in Devon, the, not far from Oakhampton, in a village called Beeworthy, near a village called Sheepwash. This amazing notice that's kind of unfathomable and sort of beautiful. And it just says, where can we go? to watch people play badminton and eat our sandwiches. <laughs> yes, where can we go? I like the way it's got badminton in a big thing like that. And I've pinched it so nobody will ever know. All, where can we go? I don't know. You tell me. I've got millions of these. I found that in the school. What kind of advice is that to give kids? <laughs> I do talk fast. Uh, I told my wife I was only going to the shop. 
She wonder where I am. I'm decent. <laughs> I think laughing is great. Laughing makes you feel better. I like laughing. Laughing is good. Um, in the millennium, there was a big fund when the lottery first started. They were giving out a lot of money to village halls to do them up. And I do a lot of gigs in village halls. Got them gigs to keep me spiritual. Do, do a lot of gigs in village halls. And I was up at a place called Ireby, uh, near Bassenthwaite in Lake District. And they've got a brand new village hall. And they said, can you use our new dressing rooms? I said, yes, I can. They said, we're very proud of them. I said, yes, I'll use them. This fantastic notice. Two notices in the dressing room. This one that says, please do not close the curtains. <laughs> and that's strange. That's strange because it's a dressing room. And this one that says, Please switch the stairs lights off. If you can read this, you've not switched them off. <laughs> so, 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 so I said, what's the point of that one? They said, don't shut the curtains. So if you don't shut the curtains, you can't see that one. I said, oh. This is strange, can I found this one in uh, Perrinpoth, Perrinpoth Village Hall down in Cornwall. There's often this, you'll know when you go to village halls, there's always an end of session checklist for the person who's booked the village hall. This fantastic one. End of session checklist. Two, check heaters and cookers are turned off. Three, check electric appliances are turned off. There's no number one. There's no, I said to the woman, there's no number one. She went, I've been coming here since 1987, never noticed that. <laughs> Come and stick with boys. So, I'll show you one or two more of these. These just to get us in a jolly mood, because I always think uh, with this kind of thing, jolliness is a thing. My thing is, I'm always about joy and glee and delight and happiness. And the other three dwarfs. That, it's that kind of thing. Sometimes they're kind of sad, these notices. I found this in a school. This cupboard contains nothing valuable, only music. <laughs> Ecclesall Road in Sheffield, there's a big uh, Methodist church, and I was in there doing something. There was a wall with nothing on the wall. There were no doors, there was no windows, it was a completely blank wall. But this notice on the wall that says, have you asked if you can go under the arch? <laughs> and there's no arch. <laughs> <laughs> I'd ask, I would ask, but there isn't one. Oh, these are my two fair. They, they are falling to bits, <coughs> you can see they're falling to bits. And in fact, you could just print some out again, but I like the fact that they're old, you know, they're falling to bits. And tell you what happens as well, people, you'll have this happen to you all the time, when people see you on the street and go, hey, I've got a good one for you. Put this on the radio. And this one, because people know that I like notices, they give you notices that aren't funny. So, we're going to leave this here. Somebody gave me this the other day, they said, I did a gig and they said, you like notices? Eh, this is a good one. Please ensure legs marked with blue tape are folded first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see that. I'm going to I've been carrying it around for years. I'm going to abandon that. I don't know why they gave it. It's a terrible thing to do. I've got, I've got two more of these notices. Um, they are really they're falling to bits. I've only been to the wrong place once. There were two schools next door to each other in Nutsford, in Cheshire. And I was supposed to have half past ten. I'm always ridiculously, I like to be early. And I got there, and I walked in, they went, and I got there at nine o'clock. I supposed to have half past ten. They went, you're late. I said, really? They said, yeah, no time for intro, just start. So I walked in, there's 200 kids looking at me. They said, just start. So I'm doing my stuff. And teachers at opposite ends of the room looking at each other going. <laughs> and the kids have all got worksheets. Blah. And at the end, there was desultory applause. And the teacher stood up and said, well, children, I can honestly say that's the most unusual talk we've ever had from the Cheshire Fire Brigade. <laughs> because <laughs> I was in the wrong, I don't know where this fireman was. It must have been next door. And these are strange poems. And why has he brought an axe? <laughs> I wish I was making some of this up. But it's all true. I found this one. In uh, Grimsby, Grimsby Central Library staff room, there's a staff room here, there's a coffee machine, and there's a photocopier, and this thing next to photocopier, that's fantastic, tells you a great story about life in, in Grimsby, I think. It just says, keep voices down, you can be heard in reference. <laughs> so, there's all these librarians going, does that bloke still come in with mirror on a stick? Yeah. There seems to be a bloke at Bowser Library around with mirror on a stick. It's true. This is my favourite, my very favourite. Doncaster Central Library staff toilets. And it makes you wonder what they eat. It just says, Phew! Now use the air freshener and the toilet brush. <laughs> oh, God. The air freshener and the toilet brush got three extra mace, man. And I use that a lot. And <coughs> Jill Johnson, one of the old chief librarians of Doncaster, was at a gig I was doing recently and she stood up and went, I wondered what happened to that note. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't go on. It gets better, honestly, honestly, it gets better. I'll take a photo, photo isn't it? <laughs> So I'm stomaching with all the fast coming out of it, So, I've, I've always done this. I've never, I've never had another job. All I've ever done is stand up in public and tell stories. My wife, who's been married nearly 40 years now, she says she couldn't do this job for a gold pig, which is a fantastic Barnsley phrase. He says, surely, it depends on the size of the pig. She says, no, I've got to do your job for a million quid. Come in. Come right. in. I've got to start again. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll just show you what you missed. It's not much. It's not ridiculous now. We've got told you notices. Come in, come in, come in. Come in. Good morning. Good morning. It's all I can do. Hello. All right. Good. I'll do a quick recap of what we've done so far. Thank you. It's just, all I've done is, I've ordered some daft notices about things that I've done. And this won't seem funny at all, that we were building up in a kind of daft way, so I'll hold that one up. I've got a big laugh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Should I use that, that, that big laugh? Yeah, that was great one, well, that was my favourite. <laughs> no, so I'm just, I'm just going. So, I was talking about the fact that uh, all I've ever done is this. All I've ever done is this. Um, I was born in 1956, so I'm 61, so that means I was lucky enough to go to a West Riding County Primary School. And the West Riding of Yorkshire was run by a, a godlike genius called Sir Alec Clay, who said that all children are creative. And what we're about today is creativity. He said we can all, everybody, everybody can make poems, everybody can dance, everybody can sing. In our school, which was an ordinary school in Darfield, the Monkey Pit Village, it was like an arts centre. We used to have a thing, uh, the string quartet that come every term and play the same string quartet by Haydn that stopped and then started again. It always fooled us. They'd stop and go, and they'd start again. We used to have a thing called the West Riding Abstract Art Van. It had square wheels. That's not true. The driver had both eyes on the same side of his head. That's a lie. And they'd say, the band would say, I want six big boys for the abstract art. We go, on oh, me, sir. And we carry these paintings out. So what do they mean, sir? He said, they mean what they look like, boy. And this afternoon, you'll be drawing some and painting them. And I think that's what we're trying to do today, to tell everybody that we are all creative. I, I left there, I went to Wath Grammar School, same school as William Hay. The reason he's got that eye for it is that we used to his head on windows when he came in. He made the music sound. He said, you better stop that, I'll be a future leader at Tony Party. Never believed him, turned out he was. And we got there, and I think one of the best years of your life is the top juniors. Top juniors, when you're year six, you're, like, you're changing, you're becoming, you're growing up, you're excited. And my top juniors was great. Then I went to Off Grammar. The school motto, Meliora Spectare, look to better things. They told us that meant Mexburg. That's an interesting thought. And we get in there, and I was taught English by this woman called Mrs. Smith. I said, Mrs. Smith, are we going to be doing our own poems? She went, no. For the next five terms, we're going to be doing The White Company by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And I thought it was three people. I thought it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And we did that terrible thing called reading round the class. When you sit there going, in about six months, it'll be my go. <laughs> That's just from you. You read a bit. Luckily, Mrs. Smith gradually went mad. And her madness was shown by the fact she became obsessed with her feet. She'd walk into class and she'd go, get out your white coolness. She's looking at her shoes. And we go in, there's someone done with Mrs. Smith. Then she's put her shoes on the desk and get out your white coolness. Eventually, we're doing Far From the Madding Crown by Thomas and Hardy. And she stood up on the desk on the table, took her shoes off and threw them to the back of the room and said the words, I'm fed up of teaching Far From the Muddening Ground. And we thought, there's someone done with Mrs. Smith, as we were perceptive in the Durham Valley. And she was taken away and replaced by a man called Mr. Brown. Now, Mr. Brown was that person that we all want to be and perhaps that we can remember, because a lot of us can point to one teacher who really inspired us. And for me, it was Mr. Brown. He walked in. For a start, he was tall, tall and handsome, very rare in the Durham Valley. He got a beard. Nobody had seen that in Barnsley in 1970. When he walked through the middle of Barnsley in 1970 with a beard, somebody apparently shouted to him, what's that keeping there? Pigeons, else loose change. And, which was awesome because the heckle I got recently in Barnsley, which was fantastic. I was walking through the middle of Barnsley, and this car pulled up. This involves strong language, but it's all right, we passed the half past nine threshold. And he walked, and he brought Wines window down, and he went, Ian Macmillan? I went, yes. He says, you're on radio? I said, I am. He said, you're on telly? I said, yes. Did you write books? I said, yeah. He said, you're shite. And he told <laughs> off. <laughs> God bless him. God bless the working class. So, tell me, so this bloke walks in, this new teacher, tall, answers. He was wearing a green corduroy suit. We'd seen not like that before in Barnsley. He then says to me, why is he wearing a corrugated iron shed? And he walked in. But the thing about Mr. Brown was his voice. He had this amazing voice. You're all voice is the main thing for all of us in here. But Mr. Brown's voice was amazing. He walked in. He stood there and went, hello, Stuart. We went, what's this? And he went, get out your straight edges. Went, straight edges? He means rulers! And he was fantastic. He said, right, we're all going to write some poems. I went, well, Mrs. Smith said, we're going to finish off Far From Madding Crown. He said, no, we're all going to write poems. So we had to write poems, which was great. He printed them out. He got us, he, he gave us encouragement. That's what today's about as well, encouraging us. He encouraged us to write poems. He printed them out, made little books of them. The two things I disagreed about, well, one thing I disagreed with Mr. Brown about was, I was so thick, I thought essay, was spelled S full stop, A full stop, and it stood for special assignment. And I put my essay by Ian Macmillan, future Nobel Prize for Literature winner, and he took me on one side and said, Ian, Nobel Prize winners don't come from Darfield. 
And in fact, that's not true. I think they come from anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. I lost touch with Mr. Brown for years, but he was the one teacher that really, really encouraged me. Got me thinking about stories, thinking about creativity. But 10 years after he'd left, no longer, after he'd left school, I was sat watching the telly with my wife and kids. He rang up, I recognised his voice. He went, hello. Mrs. Brown on the phone. And you might remember, years and years ago, there was an advert for Lynx uh, shampoo, or Lynx aftershave. And, not Lynx, uh, advert for Lynx aftershave. And there was that thing where these cave women got attacked by dinosaurs. And they took the brows off and put a rock in the brow and threw the rock and it went, the Lynx effect. And that was Mr. Brown doing the voice. Because what happened was, I left our school, I went into a pub, and walked into the pub and went, find a beer. And this man went, is that your voice? He went, yes. He said, follow me to this recording studio, <laughs> your fortune's made. Because in those days, as you know, every time you had advert on the telly, you got 20 quid. So this boy was really rich, Mr. Brown. So, he was ringing up, he said, he's coming to see some mates in Rotherham. And he said, uh, I'll come and see you. And the kids got really excited. I said, Mr. Brown's coming, the Lynx effect man. He said, will he say the Lynx effect? I said, I'll try and work in the conversation. <laughs> so, I met him at the door, and he drove up in a big car because he was rich because every time he was on the telly he got 20 quid. He got out, no green corduroy suit anymore, looking really healthy, healthy and wealthy. And he walked in and said, look, Mr. Brown, could you say the Lynx effect for the kids? He went, all right. So he got in, the kids had stood there like in a row, and he went, the Lynx effect. And kids clapped, which I thought was nice. And then he gave an invoice for 20 quid, which I thought was really nice. That's not true, I meant that up, that was Mr. Gag. But he's still on, if you watch uh, Sky Sports, and he goes, Sky Sports, that's Mr. Brown. And if you watch, he does a lot for Channel 4, with Channel 4. It's interesting, as you know, you know voiceovers better than me. What I find interesting about doing voiceovers is that very specific language that the producer often uses. I did one for uh, Purcell Blue Gel. And I had to go, Purcell Blue Gel gets tough stains out. And they went, that word tough, can you make it a bit more mysterious? So I had to go, Purcell Blue Gel, I get tough, stains out. <laughs> and they went, that word stains, can you feather it away halfway through, then return it just before the cusp? So I had to go, Purcell Blue Gel, I get tough, stains out. <laughs> You know that better than me. So, what we're about then today is about confidence and about having a go at making something up. So, for the latecomers, we're going to make up shortly, not latecomers, people who arrive. We're going to make up a little interactive epic shortly, and then we're going to do something else. I'm a very unusual man from Barnsley, in that I make my living through talking. Because most Barnsley men hardly ever speak. I was in the barbers, they call our barber Mad Jeff in Darfield, because he wears a bow tie. That denotes madness in Barnsley. <laughs> He's mad on us. He's got a bow tie on. And I was sat in Jeff's, and he was totally full. And this man put his head around the door, and he went, ah? And Jeff went, no. And he went, right, and he went, down here. <laughs> if you could translate that into standard English, it would be, hello, barber, could you fit me before half past three? No, as you can see, I've got a shot full, sir. Right, then I'll call back this afternoon, my good man, or perhaps tomorrow morning. But it's used to, ah, no, right. And also, <laughs> when barber people meet each other on the street, as you know, they don't speak. They just do that slight sideways movement of the head. So they meet each other and they go, in fact, you do less than that, I'm doing too much because I'm excited. It's less, it's just, in fact, it's less than that, it's just, <laughs> That's all it is. It's barely perceptible to the human eye. And also, when something bad happens to a person from Barnsley, they come out with a Barnsley existential cry of despair, where they go, eeeh, after they cut me by a shrug. There's that very old joke they all know, which is great to celebrate it, about the man whose wife died, and he wanted the word, she was thine, put on the gravestone. And the store mason got it wrong and put, she was thin. And he said, she missed off the E. So he went back a week after that and put, E, she was thin. <laughs> anyway, keep laughing, keep laughing. Keep laughing. Keep laughing. <laughs> so, what I also like, what, what I also like about, this, about local radio is the fact that it does speak in our language. It speaks in our local languages, and you'll know that you know how different the language is from Sheffield to Rotherham to Doncaster to Barnsley, all, all around this region, always different. It's what they call an isogloss in linguistic terms. Uh, so. If you I live in Barnsley, so I talk like this. If you were 15 miles down the road to Sheffield, they speak completely differently. We call them D-Dars, as you know. Because we go, Naddy, Naddy, what Naddy in here? You want that? Put a hard D in the speech. Naddy, Nuckle Jack. He would have probably did that. They did that wide A. Because Sheffielders are the wide A. Naddy, Naddy, Naddy. Are they going to park your car in car park? Nuckle Jack. Nuckle Jack was in the Western Desert in the Second World War. And he was sat there on a sand dune. And the American General Mark Clark drove past. And Nuckle Jack went, Naddy, are that at your Mark Clark? He went, I am that soldier. He says, well, fighting's over there. Because, <laughs> me Uncle Jack also told this fantastic Sheffield joke that only works in Sheffield. But he went, Harry, if Dan gives me four coins, I can give you four towns. He goes, right, give him four coins, puts one on top of the other, and he goes, Dublin. Then he moves from about, and he goes, Altingham. And he goes like that, and he goes, Oldham. Then he puts them in his pocket, and he goes, Dundee. And that only works in Sheffield, obviously. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so. <laughs> 
The ice hockey is, is where the language changes. So a lot of my relatives come from North Derbyshire, from Chesterfield, Poolsburg, whereas you know they call the house the ass. It's fantastic. My auntie Mabel used to say, I've just had double glazing fitted in my ass. I've got an extension on my ass, it's a wooden. I used to have a council house, now I've got a private house. And I think that's what we do as local radio. We speak the language of the place that we're at, and we're just excited about that. I was lost in West Bromwich recently. I said to this fellow, how do I find train station? He says, you turn left at Toys Yan Wee. Fantastic. Toys are us. Yes, that's right. So, this is goes with the joining in. I know I realise only a few of us sat around the table with some kind of breezy and gabbery atmosphere. But, but well, there we go. What happens is, I go one, two, three, four, and we all go E. Well, sometimes I'm just nobody joins in, it's really embarrassing. And you go one, two, three, four, and they go, yeah. <laughs> What's worse than that is one person says it on their own, that's really sad. You go one, two, three, four, they go, yeah, yeah, they have to go and start a new life in Kilimanjaro, which can be done with the coke in the mile and drawbacks. I'll give you a couple of seconds to say to each other, how did you feel the week one there with Mesa? Well, it's Friday, get away to the weekend. You won't feel silly, you feel a certain je ne sais quoi, as they say in new houses. Let's have a go. So I go one, two, three, four, you go E. Just for the joy of the city, just for the joy. Just for the joy. <laughs> I work a lot with infants, and uh, with infants I always go, hey, we were fishing here before, and we go, that man's got to fish in here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Think about infants, is, I work a lot with them, and they've always got their own private word for toilet. They don't work in their house, but not in public. So they want to go to the toilet. Instead of going, please, may I leave the room? They go, I'd like to visit the exciting chair. <laughs> <laughs> Number 38. It's got outside the bus station. There's always one serious looking boy who stands up and says, I think it's time to try. <laughs> and then, as you know, when you visit schools, you always say, uh, any questions with infants, and infants always think they've got a question, even when they haven't. And if any questions, they always <laughs> and nobody knows why they make that noise. They've all got pins in the shirt. So sometimes they make that kind of strange keening noise where they go, ah, ah, ah. They go, this will pass half an hour until the bus. And you point to one in the front row, you go, yes, and they go, <laughs> every time you point to him, they put their hand down, you get right round to one boy in the corner, he got his hand up like that, and all the teachers are going, don't ask him, whatever you do, don't ask that boy. And you point to him, you say yes, and he always says something that's not a question. He says, uh, do you know my dad? And he said, no, he says, well, he's got his own wheelbarrow. He goes, thank you very much. And then a snap squad of non-teaching assistants take him out and he's never seen again. But the thing with infants is, I was always told to put their hands down afterwards. When I was coming here through Rotherham, there were small men walking about like this. And these were infants who weren't told to put their hands down before the sewage crashes. That's not true either. I made that too. So, let's try it. On the one, two, three, four, we go. I'm just checking everybody listening now. So. See how I'm building it up? I'm building it up. I'm building it up. Mother, mother, sit down. <coughs> One, two, three, four. E. Very good. That was good. There was a nano second of hesitation. <laughs> and, I'm like, oh, it's Friday. Let's have a go. and also, this room, it's an acoustic room. It's really interesting. It's a very interesting room. So, um, I'm on the radio a lot. Uh, I, do, I do this show on Radio 3, I do a lot on Radio 4. Uh, when I first started, my mother used to insist that my dad listened in a separate room on a different radio because she thought he put the ratings up. That's sad for two. She, she, thought, she, she thought the BBC was like a big bank of red lights. One more from Angela. She was in a wheelchair. She used to push me into the room. Get in there, Harry. I'm taking five radios with her. But when I first started, I was, at, I was at Radio Sheffield. Did a show on Radio Sheffield. And that was all about, like you've all done, saying yes to things. So what happened was, uh, this fantastic radio producer called Dave Sheesby, who did now, who once arrived a year early for a gig. Which is an amazing thing. I like to be early. This book was a year early. They booked him at Huddersfield Arthur's Circle in 2006, and he turned up in 2005. And he walked in, they're all sat there, they went, you're early. And he went, don't you start to laugh, Bass? He said, no, you're a year early. He went, I'm not. And he got his letter out, and he went, I am. I'm a year early. He said, can I do me talk while I'm here? They said, no, this year's speak is here. You'll have to come back next year. And the great thing was, he forgot to go back. <laughs> so they all sat there, they went, you were here a year since. But, uh, anyway, so I was, uh, Dave Sheep interviewed me on Radio Sheffield, and I made him laugh. He says, can I make the laugh every week? I said, yes, not knowing if I could. So I did this thing in the little letter from Barnes, and they call it, on Radio Sheffield. Because in those days, in the afternoons on Radio Sheffield, there was a lot of kind of produced speech. So I did that, and then they said, can, can you do it live? And as you know, the first time you speak live on the radio is the most frightening thing in the world. Because you think, I'm going to sound such a fool. I'm going to sound an idiot. Your voice, you can't, you can't go, you can't speak. You drown, you think you sound like that. But then, once you've done it, as you know, it becomes easier, it becomes easier. Then this fellow said, uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to Radio 4, says Dave Sheesby. Have you got any ideas? I said, yeah, I've got loads of ideas. I had no ideas, but I thought, eventually thought of some ideas. And as you know, it comes from that, from saying yes, from thinking of where these stories can come from. But Radio Sheffield, when it used to be up uh, on Broom Grove Road, up that, uh, on Broom Hill, I mean, they had 
The world's oldest coffee machine. Now you know, when you worked in local radio a long time, you've been to lots of places, sometimes you find the old coffee machines. When coffee machines were first invented, you didn't get a paper cup. You put your money in, you had to put your own cup under first, the paper cups for later development. And in very small letters at Radio Sheffield, it says, put cup under first. And I always forgot. And I put my money in, and instead of getting a cup of coffee, I got coffee, which is slightly different. And this hot coffee hits you on the hand. And if from anywhere else in the world, you go, oh dear me, hot coffee on the hand. And because you're from Barnsley, you go, eee, more bad news. So, when we've got E, we have to go, drinks machines, drinks machines, I've never been keen on drinks machines. Let's try that. <laughs> you won't feel that. Also, years ago, I used to work at a tennis ball factory in Barnsley with a man called Alan, who made his own false teeth out of wood. He said, if it's all right for George Washington, it's all right for me. What he actually said was, it's not right for you, because they didn't fit that well. And also, in that fantastic thing where he goes, if it's all right for George Washington, <laughs> Like I think I think for being told off by a superior, the comedy which is yes is a great thing, it's all adopted. I'm really annoyed with you, but I'm sorry. I apologize. Profoundly unprofuse with demeanor. I like your repertoire of laughing, it's great. That's fantastic. I'm where am I next week? Come along. No, oh, God. You've all done that thing where you just went and this one of the day, no, I've had to, just like a village all game. The woman on front row didn't laugh once, all the way through, just, I thought, I'm going to make you laugh, I'm going to make you laugh. Didn't make you laugh. But then she shook me on, she went, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had, and I said, she said, I never laugh, I never laugh. <laughs> so, <coughs> let's try it. I'll go one, two, three, four, we've got drinks machines, drinks machines, I've never been keen on drinks machines. Comedy was in the ass if you wish. It all helps, it all helps, to enjoy, enjoy and delight in the room. <laughs> Oh, it's just warming, rather. Might be from Melodies. Right, let's do it. One, two, three, four. Drinks machines, drinks machines. I've never been keen on drinks machines. It's like going to asthma clinic. That's good. So, good, it's good. That's right, yes, bash the table in July. It's like some kind of revivalist meeting. It's happening. People laughing, people bashing the table, people wiping the brows. Oh, it's great. It's never had so much fun for years. It's fantastic. So, we'll put the two together. So, on a one, two, three, four, and we go E, drinks machines, drinks machines. I've never been keen on drinks machines. Let's do it. You all right? You're all right. You're all right. You're all right. Yes, perfect. Honestly. Are <laughs> 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 filming all this? Filming, filming, please. Very much, I've got no chance. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what, to make it more dramatic, to make it more dramatic, I'm going to go out of the room and come in. In a dramatic fashion. When I come through the door, I'm going to pretend to bang my head on the door, but only for comedy effect. I'll come in and I'll go, we'll practice the chorus first. The two, the, so I'll go one, two, three, four, and we'll go E, drinks machines, drinks machines. I've never been keen on drinks machines. Let's try them. <laughs> One, two, three, four. E! Drinks machines, drinks machines. I've yeah. never been keen on drinks machines. They wish I had a wedding reception in here. I'm sorry, I just found this. What a sad thing. They wish I had a wedding reception in here. That's so sad. Anyway, so, you're the goddess, I'll do the verse. You do the verse if you want, but you don't know it. Nothing would happen. You can open your mouth, no command. We're going to go out the room, I'm going to come in in a dramatic fashion. I feel like an Alan Aitbaum play, this room. It's got many doors. I'm going to go out, I'm going to come in. Then we're going to make up the first of the interactive engines. You're doing really well, you're doing really well. Friday morning, you're doing really well. Fantastic. That was the last match uh, David Flipcroft was in charge of. a fantastic thing. And we got a fantastic stunt for a band called Stretch, who was a really tall book, good for Tom. Uh, but the throat clean, that's a good sign, so I like to see it, so. <coughs> I'm going to go out coming. I might come in through that door. <laughs> All right. Ah, I will. No, I won't. Aha, who knows? I'll go one, two, three, four. We've got E, drinks machines, drinks machines. I've never been keen on drinks machines. Then that, that's what I'm It's like a strange French film. <laughs> I can't see on, on channel 4 later. <laughs> mother, mother, just sit down. So my mother's brought a saxophone, but we finished. Sit down. <laughs> just so excited. Right, let's try it now, let's try it. I'm not going to be hurt when I bang the other door. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I've 
people laughing when I'm not in the room. That's, that's the joy, that's the joy. When people laugh when you're in the room, that's good. When they're laughing when you're not in the room, that's what we're all here for today on Storytelling. They're laughing when we're not in the room. That's what we want. That should be our new thing for the Links FM group. They're laughing when we're not in the room. That should be our strat line. They're laughing when we're not in the room. I'm going to write a two. I'm going to write a minute. <laughs> well, that's what I've got. 25 bleed proof leaves. We all wish we had. So, sometimes you get a budgie trapped in these pens that speaks to us from beyond the budgie grave. That may not happen today. It's got to do it. They're laughing when we're not in the room. <laughs> This is some kind of weird dream. This is a weird dream. This is a weird dream. Come on out. Please stay. Oh, right. I'm going to try to do it for later on. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Right, let's try it. So don't forget the chorus. Drinks machines, drinks machines. I've never been keen on drinks machines. Right then. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Dr. Cookie. <laughs> we need a separate room. We need a separate room. <laughs> but this, this is the reaction that our listeners get all the time. They listen to it. Joy and glee and bashing the table and laughing and going, this is great, and sweating and wiping their eyes and wishing they'd have some cookies. Let's have a go. Perhaps we'll turn it down. See what it says here? It's 1842 in the evening. People <laughs> <laughs> must stop laughing now. I'm not in the room. That's it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I always get some cheap laughs, so I'll do it again. <laughs> when I go to school, I always do that. Can you do that again? Will you bang your head on? Yes, I can. Because it's about joy and glee and delight and daftness for me. Oh, it's 1843. <laughs> mother, mother, mother. <laughs> 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 One, two, three, four. E! Coffee, coffee, tastes like mud, it was ground this morning, so it should. Insert coins, coins return, insert coins, coins return. Cook drops down, fingers burn, why do I never learn? O, R, O, E, spilt all my flipping tea, time for the chorus, E. Drinks machines, drinks machines, I've never been keen on drinks machines. A 1P, 2P, 5P, 10, 20P, 50, start again. White, black, extra white, normal whipped, it tastes like... Dirt, he drinks machines, drinks machines, I'm never being keen on drinks machines. You get chocolate, you get pop, don't press that button, it won't stop. Dripping, spilling, slopping, slipping, sliding, screaming, diving, swimming, in a sea of chocolate soup, in a sea of chocolate soup, last time for the chorus. E drinks machines, drinks machines, I've never been keen on drinks machines. Well joined in, this is sounding so good. Might do one more joiner in it just to get us in the mood. Uh, then we'll make up the interactive epic. You'll see that what we're doing today, we're making stories out of everything. We're making stories out of this room. This room is not a very exciting room, but we're making stories about the door, we're making stories about everything. And we're making them together. That's the exciting thing, that's the exciting thing. And just because of the kind of ridiculous nature of the huge laughs and people bashing the table and it's making this morning memorable. You know, we will think about this for years. Was it that time when we couldn't laugh so much? Some people had to be hospitalised. Because <laughs> <laughs> people will pretend they were here and weren't. I'm going to went to Wembley twice. They were out. How were they? You weren't. What happened to you? What happened to you? First time at Wembley when we played Oxford in the uh, Johnson's Paint Trophy. I got down there and this enormous block next to me. Gentleman block. He says, "What they are doing here?" I said, "I've got a season ticket." So I thought that'd be sat with Dicky Bird. I said, I don't want to see me deep there. So I thought that'd be something with Parkinson. I said, I don't want to see me deep there. He says, Ian, uh, I get a bit emotional. I said, no, we all do. We all do. He said, I might, I might have to wear my scarf. I said, all right. So, because we're not very demonstrative in Barnsley. So, after a bit, he goes, Ian, scarf's coming out. <laughs> so he starts doing his half out of thing, like a kind of Morris dancer with his scarf. But then at the end, when we won, it was fantastic. He says, Ian, I'm going to get emotional. I said, go on then. He took his shirt off enormously. <laughs> Blow, took his shirt off, he collapsed to ground, he started beating ground with his fist, shouting, Me dad! Because his dad used to take him to match, he couldn't take him anymore. Then he stood up and he said this fantastic bouncy thing, he says, Ian, does that mind if I embrace thee? He says, yeah, if that wants. He did this fantastic bouncy embrace with the eyes, he touched me, he's like, him. I said, yeah, that could hook me if that wants, he goes, no, that ain't, that all right. That wonderful bouncy phrase, no, that all right, that all right. So, 
The other thing we're going to do during him before we make up the interactive epic is we've got three grandchildren now, and my little one Noah, he's about eight months old, and I can't wait to read him the Bosman Bat books. We've all read Bosman Bat books. The more Bosman Bat books you read, the more you realise that nothing happens. In Bosman Bat books, like again, it's Samuel Beckett play, no happens. Bosman Bat goes out, he posts his letter. That's the end of the book. Sometimes <laughs> he loses the letter, Mrs. Goggins comes over in the slippers and finds it and posts it. You think, I could write them, I could write them books. I met the bloke who wrote Bosman Bat, they call him John Gunliffe, lives in Ilkley, lovely fella. You must never say to him, hello John, made a lot of money out of Bosman Bat, because he gets so cross. Because when they signed the contract for the books and the films, they went, what about the merchandising? He went, no, you're all right. So all those years of Boston's back merchandise, he never got a penny. Made sure he did with Rosie and Jim, so he's financially secure. But I thought, I could actually make up some virtual sequels to Boston's back about these brothers. And I've written four, four sequels to Boston's back. But I've only written a song. And the first one is Milkman Jim. And the song goes, Milkman Jim, Milkman Jim, his favourite milk is semi-skim. <laughs> <laughs> I realise it's absolutely ridiculous, but I because this is a moment of joy and glee and delight and happiness and ridiculousness. So, I'll go in again, I'll go, well boys and girls, who have we come to see today? And you go, Milkman Jim. And I go, right, let's sing the Milkman Jim song. And we go, Milkman Jim, Milkman Jim, his favourite milk is semi-skimmed. <laughs> <laughs> this broom's got so many doors and so many plugs, hasn't it? It's got a place, all these plugs, all these doors. Somebody's at the wedding reception in here. Strange. <laughs> I'm not this when you go around any public hall, I'm not seeing it yet. Normally, on the ceiling, you see a bit of last year's Christmas decoration. <laughs> Normally, it's usually you see it, usually see it. <clears throat> and what this is about, obviously, it's about making stories about anywhere you go. Whenever I go into schools, you never have anything planned, as you know. You just walk in and there's some weird thing and just make stories about it. Anyway, so. <clears throat> more clubs. So it's Milkman Jim, Milkman Jim, his favourite movie. <laughs> mother, mother, come on. <laughs> that always seems a trace notice, you know, fire door keeps you. <laughs> well, boys and girls, who are we coming to see today? Milkman Jim. You're right, let's sing a Milkman Jim song. Milkman Jim, Milkman Jim, his favourite milk is sunny skin. Just yes. go. Get more and more complicated now, the next one's Postman Pete. He goes, Postman Pete, Postman Pete, gave up the job because he had bad feet. Let's try that. <laughs> I was doing a show down in Cornwall. There was a bloke on front row having a great time until this moment. I went, Postman Pete, Postman Pete, gave up the job because he had bad feet. But got up and walked out. I went, that's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Gout. I'm sorry, Rob. <laughs> oh, no. Don't walk out, Rob. Please don't walk out. He can't. I know. I'd love to walk out, but I can't. I might have got that from the thing. I'd love to walk out, but I can't. Because I'm, I'm held by compelling broadcasting. That's it. I'd love to walk out, but I can't. That's what right. so we want. Folks would like to walk out of the room, but they can't because they're going to pick kids up from school, but we're telling such a great tale on radio, they can't walk out. That's great. Good for me. Right then. Well, we've got to keep doing that. That's why I love flip charts so much. The whole technology. I was telling some people earlier on that in my role as Zedley celebrity, I had to open a new old folks' home in Goldthorpe. And they, they, they were, he said, uh, we're going to see Miserable Frank on front row because he never laughs. If you make Miserable Frank laugh, you'll be doing all right. To run. This bloke said on front row, Miserable Frank, and I got the flip chart. We made a point about it, and he's laughing. He's having a good time, Miserable Frank, right? Then suddenly, flip chart collapsed onto Miserable Frank. <laughs> and he went, I, I should eat the way a stick, he said. So he goes, so he goes, Postman beat, Postman beat, gave up the job because he had bad feet. Let's try it. So I'm going to come in and all do that together. <coughs> There's only 28 verses to this. <laughs> Some blokes walking past. Looking in at this one. <laughs> Saying the words, it's just students acting down. <laughs> well, gentlemen, who we come to see today? 
Oh, You're right, let's sing the Boss from Peace song. Boss from Peace, Boss from Peace, gay on the job, cause he had bad feet. Very good. We get more and more complicated now, the next one's Bin Man Bill. <laughs> it goes, Bin Man Bill, Bin Man Bill, got flattened by a runaway lorry that could hear that control down a very steep bill. That's right. <laughs> We can have a dead event, the link's group. We can do it. So it's Big Man Bill. You don't know the words, just to the tune. Just go, Big Man Bill, Big Man Bill, do like, do like, do like. Go up the hill, it'll be fine. Just for the joy and glee and delight of the city. This room seems to be getting smaller, doesn't it? I see. That is balls going in. Anyway. Really? So it's Big Man Bill, Big Man Bill, got flattened by a runaway lorry that created out of control down a very steep hill. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, we come to see today. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's sing the Big Man Bill song. Big Man Bill, Big Man Bill, got flattened by an unruly body that can hear down the control down a red steep hill. Bring out jazz hands. Uh, we'll miss our butcher Frank for obvious reasons. And we'll straight on because he transferred to that West Bank. And we'll straight on to my favourite. Bath's attendant Ronald. Bath's attendant Ronald. Bath's attendant Ronald. Bath's attendant Ronald in his black and white striped trunks. Early in the morning, he puts in the chlorine. Let's try that. <laughs> so it's Bath's attendant Ronald. Bath's attendant Ronald. Bath's attendant Ronald in his black and white striped trunks. Early in the morning, he puts in the chlorine. Ran to a bath on Saturday, whether I need one or not. <laughs> Mm. Now we make up the interactive epic. The first of many. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we come to see today. I see you. <laughs> we got this bath's attendant wrong. <laughs> bath's attendant wrong. <laughs> oh, man, that silence. People are like, <laughs> That's Lieutenant Ronald. And the song goes, that's Lieutenant Ronald, that's Lieutenant Ronald, that's Lieutenant Ronald in his black and white striped trunks. Early in the morning, he puts in the glory. I pity David Lloyd on film after this. Not do. <laughs> 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 right. Let's try again. <laughs> well, I gentlemen, we come to see today. <laughs> You're right. Let's <laughs> sing the Bass of Ten Bass of Ten Ronald. Bass of Ten Ronald. Bass of Ten Ronald. In his black and white striped trunks. Early in the morning. What's he doing? He was in the glory. Well done. Oh, we are now assembled. That was great. That sounds really good. So, let's have a think about. Well, I think that, that line there. They're laughing when we're not in the room. It's just a fantastic thing. Because that's in that what, to me, that's what storytelling is about. Is that somehow, it's all right when you're in the room and they're laughing. But it's like afterwards. That's what Amazon Walker, did you hear so and so on radio? Did you hear what he said? Did you hear that thing he said? Did you hear that thing she said? Did you hear what they said? It's that kind of thing. So somehow, when we've left the room, when they, the listener, have left the room and we've left the studio, they're still thinking about what we said. So, I write that up. They're laughing when we're not in the room. My writing's terrible, ladies and gentlemen, but there you go. The writing red is done. They're laughing when we're not in the room. Quite a long line, that. They're laughing when we're not in the room. <coughs> At all the tales we tell. I declare today, 28th of July, apostrophe amnesty day. Put them away. <laughs> because in the end, nobody dies. I've just a few spares down here for later on. <laughs> I love it when folks go, I'm cleverer than that gross at the time where the apostrophe goes into my heart. Well, get alive. <laughs> I know that's not, we're not allowed to do that, of course, but they will die out in about 10 years that'll come. So, that's my prediction. Let's try. So that's how it goes. So I'll go, I'll go one, two, three, four. And we'll go. The laughing when we're not in the room. Uh, I'd like to watch songs like a song, we're not singing, but it could be a song. The laughing when we're not in the room. At all the things we tell. Don't mind doing that kind of mock Sinatra arm movement. But I was just saying, in fact. So the rhythm will be The laughing when we're not in the room. And all the tales we tell. Let's try to sing that too. It's got to sound something for a backbeat on it. Could be a Christmas hit. Yes, it could. Don't <laughs> mind that. One, two, Three, four. They're laughing when we're not in the room at all the tales we tell. Very good. Everybody in the room's got a job, one or two owner occupiers, not an normal audience. We can think 
of a rhyme for room that fits the lines. The next one's going to go there, laughing when we're not in the room at all the tales we tell. I can think of the tune, I just can't think of the words. The great thing about this is we can't get it wrong. It's not like sums, it's not like anything else. We can't get this wrong. It's about storage, it's about the way we tell it, it's about what, what stories are. So any idea what the next line could be? We are laughing when we're not in the room at all the tales we tell. Some of them might rhyme with room. I found with this that telepathy is no good because I have no receiving equipment. They're laughing when they're using the broom. That's good, they're laughing when they're using the broom. That's a good <laughs> I can see a dance movement for this. When's the contemporary dancer coming? Not yet. <clears throat> they're laughing when they're using the broom. That's a great line. It's got rhythm, it's got rhyme, it's fantastic. It's like the Renaissance in here. Except they're only two the storms in here. They're laughing <laughs> when they're using the broom. That is good. <coughs> Sounds like a euphemism. You're all right. I've been using the broom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my life. Sorry, my life. Yes, using the broom. Is <laughs> he still got a job? No, he's using the broom. It could be, could be no. Could be fantastic. <laughs> Doctor, are you all right? I've been using the broom. <laughs> That's a great thing. Oh, this language is great. They're laughing when we're not in the room at all the tales we tell. They're laughing when they're using the broom. I don't think of a rhyme that rhymes with tell. <coughs> swell. Swell is a good word. Swell. Smell is a good word. Smell, smell is a nice smell. They're laughing when they're using the broom. Be like catchphrase. As if they're under a spell. That's good! Hey, hey, yes! Hey. Where's the prizes? <laughs> cup of tea. Cup of tea. Was it? Was it? Was it? The, what? Spell. I've got spell. what you said. I don't know what you said. Spell. It's as, can I put, it's as if, just for the reason, it's, yeah. it's as if they're under a spell, which is, that's right, that's what stories do, they put people under a spell, <coughs> it's as if they're under a spell, that's good. So it goes, they're laughing when we're not in the room, but all the tales we tell, they're laughing when they're using the broom, it's as if they're under a spell, yeah, that's great, good God almighty. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work, in village halls, I did one in a place called Old Leap near Boston, it's, you know it, yes. <laughs> it was, uh, oh, it's a Britain's gout capital. <laughs> we all know them because it was a village, there was a small but keen audience. And I said, right, we're going to make some of about Old Leak. This broke his hand up, he went, it's not Old Leak, it's Old Leak. I said, okay, what can you tell me about Old Leak? And he went, it's you near. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, it. it is you. <laughs> but this, this is much better. Let's try to say it. This is sounds great. Ah, this could become the Leet FM corporate song. You sing and sit out of every meeting, just plays your aerobics. Let's try to stop. One, two, three, four. They're laughing when we're not in the room. That's all the tales we tell. They're laughing when they're using the broom. It's as if they're under a spell. That's good. Hey. Eh? Second verse. Let's try and look. maybe keep the same line. Oh. The other thing about stories is they make you laugh, but they also make you think, or they make you remember. That's the great thing. That is one of the fantastic things about local radio, I think, that people, the music makes them remember, remember exactly where they were at a certain time and a certain thing. And also, the, the, just a simple link can make people remember exactly where they were at a certain time. And particularly, in, you know, places like Barnes that we, you know, kind of in close communities. So, they're thinking, you have to change the colour, they're thinking when we tell them the tale. They're thinking when we tell them the tale. You see here, we've got this, what points called the AB, AB rhyme structure, which goes room, tell, room, spell. So, they're thinking when we tell them the tale, so that the next line doesn't have to rhyme. Because we're not quite trying to rhyme yet. Any ideas what it could be? They're thinking when we tell them a tale. I put them, but it's probably M for the uh, room. They're thinking when we tell them a tale. Not easy, it's not easy. But we can do it. Any ideas? See, I'm not looking at you, so I don't have to have eye contact. I've got three on the pressure. Picturing it inside their head. Picturing it inside their head, that's good. That is good. They're thinking when we tell them a tale, picturing it inside their head. Can, I say, can we say they picture it? Yeah. So it seems easier than picturing. 
is a nice word, but I think they picture it inside their head. That's really good. Because again, that's what they always say, picture the words, easier said than done. They picture it inside their head. That's great. They're thinking when we tell them the tale, they picture it inside their head. Your ramming tail. From top of hill to down the bottom of the veil. From top of hill to bottom of veil. That's great. <laughs> Jesus, this is good. <laughs> From top of hill to bottom of veil. I'll put a few apostles in. Top, top of hill to bottom of veil. Like Lancashire. And they go, I'm going to Thabit to her. They put it, I've got, I've got to Thabit. I do work like, I like working like shit, but I find you can never get a cup of tea out of them. Because you go back to their house and they go, do you not want a cup of tea? You're like, no, you haven't asked me yet. Do you not want a cup of tea? I don't know, have you not had one, have you? From top of till to bottom of veil. This is great. I'm going to put a tip. We won't say the tip, but it just helps the rhythm. They're thinking when we tell them a tale, they picture it inside their head. From top of till to bottom of veil. <laughs> We're all going to end up dead. We're all going to end up dead, that's right. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually living donkey. Right, you're right. That's it, it's a hill. We're all going to end up dead, that's a fact. <laughs> that is a fact. <laughs> the We're all going to end up dead. Empty. The end. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> That's what the kids always do. Then, then I'm fucked up, then I went to sleep. We're all going to end up dead. <clears throat> They're thinking when we tell them a tale. They picture it inside their head. From top of hill to bottom of veil, we're all going to end up dead, except for Uncle Fred. <laughs> eh? Uncle Fred! Uncle Fred, you mark Uncle Fred. Except for oh, his shed. In his shed, that's right. Except for Uncle Fred. In his, we need a word before, in his something shed. Potting shed. Potting oh, shed. Oh, except God. for Uncle Fred. <laughs> in his potting shed. <laughs> <laughs> They're thinking when we tell them a tale. They're picturing inside their head. From top of hill to bottom of veil, we're all going to end up dead. Except for Uncle Fred. In his potting shed. There must be one more rhyme for Fred and Ben. Cousin Ned. Yeah. With Cousin Ned, that's right, in his potting shed. With the ghost of Cousin Ned. <laughs> oh, Cousin Ned. I remember him. The ghost of Cousin Ned. Who's still rotting in his bed. Who's still rotting in his bed, that's right. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Can we turn this into a musical? Oh, still rotting in his brain. Oh, this is great. <laughs> they're thinking when we tell them a tale, they picture it inside their head. From top of hill to bottom of veil, we're all going to end up dead. Except for Uncle Fred in his potting shed with the ghost of Cousin Ned, who's still rotting in his bed. <laughs> while, his, while his wife's giving him tea. <laughs> That's a I'll go. <laughs> you all know what that line is. <laughs> so I put, put some extras in. We've come to that on the radio. Oh, that's a great thing. That's a great thing about Ryan. That he just makes big and fantastic things. Let's try some whole thing from the start. This is great. This is <laughs> we need it. No. Start from the game. Oh God, look at this. <clears throat> You see how we made this up from nothing? We had no, I had no idea. I had no idea. I've still got no idea. I've got no idea. You've got no idea. You've got no idea. You've got no idea. Right, let's start from the beginning. <clears throat> I'll pretend to be a, a, an employee of Magnet walking past. And I'll go, I'll walk in, I'll go, there's some funny noises in here. And I'll go, they're laughing when we're not in the room. That'll work out, won't it? That'll work out. Yeah. It's often a mysterious object. <laughs> It's <laughs> the mystery thing. <laughs> anyway, when we get to end of the point, could you hand me the mystery thing? <laughs> Keep it a mystery object. So, that's it. So, when we get to end of the point, when we do the rude line that I hand to, so I go. <laughs> That's the end of the point. Ah! Right, let's try that. 
I'm talking it's got limited comedy effects. But it's not here. Not here. Not here. That's true. Not here. That's a fact. Really sound activation. <laughs> oh dear. Could be, could be a quiz, could it? Can we do on radio? Can we have people I'm jumping <coughs> tunes to try and guess it? You know, like you could have, what could you have there? Yeah, that's not I did it my way. <laughs> no, yeah. That's a Mr. Voice, isn't it? Mr. Antrum. You can do it. Anyway. So, wait, what's your name? Ross. So, Ross, what's happening? You're going to the end of the poem. I'll go, that's the end of the poem. Then you pass us that, and I go, he has the mystery thing. <laughs> and you, you go, <laughs> God, this is great. Look at this. This one didn't exist before we said. It's unusual to have some shiny paper on the flip chair. No, it's not. He has to say something to it. Mm. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I had these moments of car. It's good. That went very soon. The stuff's going up and down. Oh, yeah. <coughs> right. <coughs> it's mysterious. Oh, there's also this room appears when you first walk in it to be the blandest room in the world, but it's full of strange mystery things like this mystery divider and this look. The cheese. Do <laughs> you have that at all? Do you have that at all? <laughs> two, two objects. Two mystery objects. Yeah, yeah. I thought it might. I didn't yeah. sorry, but I had two yeah. mystery objects. Fantastic. Oh, I can get two mystery objects. I was telling somebody earlier on that last night, about half eight, the phone rang, and this answer phone was probably, who am I talking to? I said, who am I talking to? <laughs> he says, Dave Thorpe. I said, what, Dave Thorpe that I went to college with? He says, yeah. 40 years ago, Dave Thorpe. I said, no, we met, we met up, didn't we, Dave, about three or four years ago in Doncaster. We had a dinner out. He says, no, we met 11 years ago. Blank time flies by. And I says, how are you doing, Dave? He says, I'm on my own now. I thought he's left his wife. Both his parents were dead. And he still lived in the same house we were brought up in. That's the strange thing. He lives in this house in Newark. Brought up in this house. Went to college briefly in Stafford. Came back. Went back to the factory. He left. Worked in his factory all his life. Retired now. Mum and dad both dead. I said, what do you do, Dave? I don't know very much. He says, Thursdays I go out for a pint. I said, Blanks, we're going to meet up in New York. In that interest, I'm just, it's interesting that there is no story to Dave. You know what I mean? I feel sorry for Dave because he entered a big life. He entered as much fun in his 61 years as we've had it last hour. You know, that's the thing. If only Dave was here now, he'd have a great time. I would bring Dave in. We could have the, he could have a big project. Anyway, so next time I see you, I'll tell you what happened because me and Dave are meeting up in New York at the end of September. And we'll all meet again. I'll tell you what happened. No, oh, that. Come on, come on, shall we go? Let's all go. <laughs> to the links of them trip. Hey, I'm Dave. Here's yeah. some new friends for you. That'd be great. Right. Oh, Dave. <laughs> Dave thought. So, do the whole thing from the start. So I'm going to oh, mind it back. Sorry. So I'll come in. I pretend to be a magnet employee. Do that bit. We get to the end. The mystery of you. Right. You're really well doing great. Some kind of camera. Right? You broadcast live on a big screen in the room. <laughs> Could be, that'd be great, wouldn't it? That'd be great. <coughs> what? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, what, what you're doing in here? That's what I said, what you're doing in here. Which is, you're is a fantastic band of phrase, particularly. <coughs> <clears throat> there was that thing. I can hear some strange noises. What y'all are doing in here? They're laughing when we're not in the room. And all the tales we tell. They're laughing when we're using the broom. It's as if they're under a spell. They're thinking when we tell them the tale. They picture it inside the head. From top of hill to bottom of bell. We're all going to end up dead. Except for Uncle Fred. In his spotted shed. With a ghost of cousin Ned. Who's still rocking in his bed. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of the point. <laughs> Lift him higher. No, we can't talk to him. Ah! He has the mystery objects. <laughs> they do have that effect. <laughs> the mystery objects. So. As we can see, the mystery of all they really are, all they really are, is a bit of wood to keep the door on, and some kind of bit of carpeting, I think, a bit of underlay. So, let's pretend though, that when this was a steelworks, these were very important. 
There were strange, mysterious objects. I'm trying to say there strange, mysterious movies. There were strange, mysterious objects. Let's pretend that since the steel works shut, people have been looking for these. So, what I'd like to do is, on the back of your bit of paper, on the back of your, uh, your thing, your agenda is the word I'm looking for, write me down just a couple of lines about what the mysterious objects might be. Don't forget, we can't be, we can't be, we can't be rude about people in the room or anything. <laughs> write me down what the mysterious objects might be. A couple of minutes on that, just the mysterious objects. So what we've got there is, to recap what we've done so far, <coughs> you'll notice that a lot of the things I talk about are kind of stories from my life. And they're fairly, they're maybe, is that another one you're passing me? No, I'm saying, wait, what the, and, yes, no. It seemed to make sense when he said it. Yeah. But then, so, yeah, so as you see, a lot of the tales that I tell are just about my life and about what's happened. And things happen to us all the time. That's what we make stories out. That's how our lives are. Things happen to us. Often the most mundane things you can make a story out of. And uh, all the things I talk about are true, they're a bit they're slightly exaggerated, obviously, but the, everything that happens to me, things happen to me all the time. Um, just because we're here, because as you came into Magna, you see that big old uh, bison, the silver bison that used to be at Utu Kumpu Steelworks, just next to the thing. And me and my mate was a photographer, Ian Beasley, once did a thing at Utu Kumpu before they shut it, working with all the workers there, and we got them doing this, got them writing poems, got them making stories, got them doing photographs. This fellow comes and says, look, I'd like to do some poetry, but I'm not going to write poems. I went, all right. He said, I said, what about photographs? He said, no, I can't do that. And I said, he said, but I'd like to do something. So I'm trying to engage him in conversation. I said, well, how did you find out about the project? And he said, uh, the acid bath murderer told me. I says, who's he? He says, he's a mate to Oompa Loompa. I says, well, who's he? He says, well, he works with Gorbachev. And it turns out, and he, he knew the nicknames of everybody in the factory. And there they are. It's fantastic. He says, you go away and write me down nicknames. Everybody in fact, and he knew them all. And so what he did was he wrote them out on some big bits of flip chart paper. And we wrote, he wrote the, the name down, the nickname, and the real name next to him. They were do tiny stories, it was fantastic. And we're doing that, we're looking at it, and the, the boss of Utu Kumpu, who was a big tall fellow, walked past, and his mate was a little round block, and he walked past, and he said, we're all laughing. He said, what are you laughing at? He said, look at this, we've got all these nicknames here, and all the real names. He went, Ian, you are naive. He says, what? He says, not everybody in this factory's got a nickname. And he pointed to it and went, that's disgusting. Because it turned out he was the acid bath murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and his mate was the Oompa Loompa. And, and so then, then we says, you can't publish these. We says, well, and we had, we had this committee, this publishing committee. And there was a vicar, local vicar on the committee. He says, look, what we can do is we can print them out without the names on. We said, well, that's not as much fun if you've got the real names. So we'll print them out without the names on. Then if we all put 50 pence in towards the church repair fund, we can get to know the real names. So I'm going to read you some of these uh, names out. Because the great thing about these names is they are like little, little stories. So once you hear the name, you can see what they look like. So for example, you've got Acid Bath Murderer. You've got uh, Beach Ball Belly. That's a fantastic one. Blackpool Joke Shop Face. That's a great nickname. Captain, <laughs> Captain Pigwash. That's a good one. There's, um, where is it? Dog on Head. Dog on Head. That ain't Dog on Head. What's that Rotherham phrase, is that, that looks like a doll's head. That's a fantastic old Rotherham phrase, because they're like, like garments, like a doll's head. Um, Edward Scissorty. There's a great list here. Fat Bloke, Fat Controller, Fat Pat, Fat Steve, not so fat Steve. <laughs> Harry, Potter, Harry Potter's Grandin. Ronnie Ronslot. Busted Settee. That's a fantastic one. <laughs> Barnsley were once playing somebody in Colchester, I think, and one of their players in Colchester got a big like mop of red hair. And he ran past and shoved his eyes out. That looks like a busted settee. <laughs> <laughs> and on bollocks. Yes, we've all, we've all worked with him. <laughs> John, call me Neil. Brother and Bob. Savage Cabbage. Mrs. Downfire. Tank Tuck Ted. Three Toad Sloth. Wash pots, thicker and diddly, poorly chicken, strange occurrence, kid, la la, psycho, poorly chicken, pappy fireman, never fathomed that one. The great thing about me is, as soon as you see anything, you can picture these people, that's the great thing, that's a wonderful thing about me now, just got to show you that. So, what we have here is the mysterious objects, I place them on the, the saucer of mysteriousness. You see, I'm going to then place them on the chair. The chair of storytelling. 
And so what we were doing is taking these ordinary objects, which is taking these ordinary things, which is what you do as presenters. I mean, all our presenters who do daily shows who can think of things all the time, not that you have to use a wooden block and so stuff. So, these are all anonymous, so we don't lose rhythm. I said the person who's written them, when I read them out, they go slightly red. <laughs> or sometimes they affect nonchalance. They go, hey, that's quite good. I want you to roll that one. That's really good. So, I'll shuffle them. I'll shuffle <laughs> <laughs> When you do poetry readings, at the end of a poem, people often murmur in delight. So I think that's what we'll do. At the end of each of these, we'll do it. <laughs> what do you mean you read your poems on? You? you pretend it's the end and they all murmur, then you carry on, they go, <laughs> So, let's have a go. It's a small car lamp for changing a tire. Ramp. It's a small car ramp. <laughs> that's Warren. That's Warren. <laughs> <laughs> That's an L, surely it's a good one. That's, That's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Yeah, of course it is. That's silly. Yeah. It's obviously an R. It's obviously an R. Yeah. He <laughs> went straight down. Straight down, so he for a ramp. Okay, obviously. Small car ramp for changing a tire. Flat frog. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him, don't tell him. Oh, sorry. It's not mine. Okay. Decomposed mouse. Table mm. leveler. Mm. I love the mixture of the practical and the impossible. Could well be a table leveler. That's a hell of a decomposed mouse. That's fantastic. Because it appears to have whiskers. It was actually appeared to have whiskers. These are great. Chunk to stop the wheel of the steel making machine. Ooh. It's good that, wasn't it? Mm. Might be the way I read it. I might try to read it. It's almost Shakespearean. I can read a Shakespearean voice. <laughs> Chunk to stop the wheel of the steel making machine. <laughs> steel workers thong. <laughs> Hence the whiskers. <laughs> the word thong always gets laughed in whatever content. Thank you. You're the only one that remembered to burn me. God, I've not laughed so much for years. This is great. It's like this will make you laugh all the time. It's fantastic. And the BBC, they're all miserable. This is great. I'll laugh it all the time. Holy Grail. <laughs> Holy Grail. Holy Grail. Didn't say which one it was. You see, you got to try and guess. Which one was it? The Holy Grail. I don't know. Put me from one side. That's Wangy's right. What do you say? Hey, don't stop. Door stop. It might not be mine, so I'm just saying if it is. All right, I'll read out what I think he said. <laughs> Dave Consortium! <laughs> <laughs> Old Chestnut Widdison! <coughs> Dave Consortium, who's that like Dave Consortium? An Old Chestnut Widdison. I like it when you can't, that's a great thing, that's a great thing. As you know, making up stuff. Making up stuff. Gold doorstop, pink carpet. What? <laughs> well, it basically said the word pink. Is that yours, Alex? Is it punk? Punk carpet? No, it's pink carpet. Pink carpet? Well, I put doorstop and carpet, you told me to talk. Well, it's true, because doorstop and carpet were quite good, but there's <laughs> <laughs> a tail. There's a tail. And now we've got a pink carpet. That's great. That's great. That's a pink carpet. That's rather than pink. Yes. <laughs> Go doorstop, pink carpet. Genie lamp. Piece of Aladdin's flying carpet. <laughs> the belt. For the thingamabob and the thingamabob. That's how we linked them. We've linked them together, you see. Who is this thingamabob? I've got the belt for it. I've got the belt for the thingamabob. That's fantastic. There's a word that looks like some mountains or, or a, a chant in a hospital for somebody who's not very well. So it's for a very small person. What do you think that says? Ramp. 
Realm gives us a realm. Anyway, whatever it is, it says, for a very small person. Thank you. You got a cow, I got it moving. I thought watching Bullseye. It is a game show, it's a fantastic game show. Treasure at the top of the hill. Somebody's done a, kind of done an illustration of each one. So I know which one he's referring to. That's good. Footrest. 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 Boot tassel. He's agreeing. So these ordinary objects become weird and magical in this strange, bland room that's become less bland the longer we've been in it. Which is great. BMX ramp for a really small mouse. <laughs> that's good, that's good, that's a good visual image. Driven over some licorice. <laughs> I don't say what has driven over licorice, but something driven over some licorice. Do you know, I'm 61 years old, I've never said that phrase before. It's a great, the new things you get to say. I've never said the phrase, driven over some licorice. It's a great, the new things you get to say. But a Friday morning at Magnum, this is great. <clears throat> tire tread, <laughs> tire tread, <clears throat> or the sole of someone's shoe. <laughs> Small goes back to step. Small car on for change of time. What we've done there is again just taking these ordinary things, taking these weird ordinary objects, and made the start of stories about them. The thing is, you want you want you wouldn't know what to do with them. You won't know what, you won't want to. Expand them, that's the trouble. What we what we make in this kind of radio is small stories. And I have to wonder if the, the story just has to be self-contained within within the moment. So, what we'll do now is we'll do the whole epic again from the start. Then it'll be time for you to ask me some how we for time. 7.33. Yes, for some hard questions for a little while. Is that alright? Hmm. I thought we might make up a couple more verses for that for that sort of But incorporating the mystery. So we're going to incorporate the mystery object. A couple more verses. That's just my question. That's all right. You're working very hard this Would you have the things again, Dean? Pass it. <coughs> all right? This is Dean, isn't it? Oh. Who's Rob? Where's Dean? Dean's there. Oh, Dean. Hi, mate. How are you doing? <laughs> I thought you were Ross for a minute. Dean. Dean. He's not called Dean either. No. <laughs> Hazel. Hazel, that's not Hazel. 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 I'm glad Dean's not here. I'm glad Dean's not good. It's an Asdean. Yay! Hey. Hey. Oh, wow. That's got to be on him. <laughs> that's got to be on him. So that's after the thing. I, I'll pretend that I still think you're called Dean. Ross and I'll go. Yeah. Dean, pass me the things, then we go, he's an Asdi. <laughs> the gag in. He's an Asdi. This is great. Normally, you do this kind of thing, you do it with kind of really dull, boring people, but it's, you know, we've got no ideas. You get these little loads of ideas, you would be amazed at the number of people, time times you do it, you know. It's, <coughs> this is great. So let's try it. It just sounds fantastic. <coughs> I love these moments of calm. <laughs> Between these deer. Mother, mother, come on. <laughs> Hello, I was just walking past. I made some strange noises. One, two, three, four. They're laughing when we're not in the room. I'd love to walk out. That's, that's not the point, is it? <laughs> that's not the point. Hey, hey, that's not the point. Hey, <laughs> See, I'm in the room. I don't like it anymore. <laughs> I'm to the point. The trouble is, you get more excited, you know this, you get more excited about the thing you're going to do next than the thing you've just done. So the thing you're going to do next, you're going to think that's more interesting than that. Interesting, interesting. That's the whole thing about storytelling, you get more excited about what's going to happen next. Right then, Ross, I know you call Ross, but I'm going to pretend you call Dean. Hello, I've heard some strange noises coming out of this room. They're laughing when they're not in the room. At all the tales we tell. They're laughing when they're using the broom. 
It's as if they're under a spell. They're thinking when we're telling the tale, they're preaching inside their head. From top of hell to bottom of hell, we're all going to end up dead. Except for Uncle Fred, in his potting shed, with the ghost of Cousin Ned, who's still rotting in his bed. <laughs> He has the objects. Thank you, Dean. He's He's nice. Nice. <laughs> so, let's pretend there actually was. <laughs> somebody. <laughs> that was good. So, let's pretend there actually was somebody who worked in the steelworks called Dean. And he came to a tender end. <laughs> they called him. Has D. Mm. It could be like a song, I think. This could be like a song. I'll go one, two, three, four, we'll go. They call him Has D. It used to be an Elvis style. He did? Yeah. Uh, they call him Has D. Has D. They call him Has D. They call him Has D. Perhaps he was one of those Elvis impersonators that you get. Ah. They call him Has D. He called himself the king. Oh, this is great. Oh, sweet. <laughs> he called himself Hasdi. He called himself the king. Oh, sweet. Let's try doing it in an Elvis voice. One, two, three, four. He called him Hasdi. He called himself the king. Oh, sweet. Let's pretend. There's something terrible happened to Hasdi in this steelworks. They call him Hasdi. We're we'll trying to get the same rhyme, I think, as we did before. So something to rhyme with D. They call him Hasdi. He called himself the King of Swing. He got he hit slipped. by a bee. He got <laughs> hit by a bee. <laughs> That's great. He got hit by a bee. It's from Lightfield. <laughs> He's in <laughs> chairs. Right he got hit <laughs> by a beam. <laughs> Which made him permanently dream. <laughs> well, yeah. Which That's made him permanently table. dream. This is great. Huh? Table with brains over there. Oh. And brain. beauty. And beauty, yeah. <laughs> 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 he called him Hasdi. He called himself the king of swing. He got hit by a beam. Which made him permanently dream. Let's do it. This is so great. Can we form a community choir? Let's have a go. One, two, three. They call him Hasdi, he called himself the king of swing. He got hit by a bee, which made him permanently dream of fresh cream. Fresh cream. <laughs> of fresh cream. <laughs> and donuts. Or so it would seem. Or oh, so it would seem! <laughs> oh my god! god. So this is the best. Cake, he landed on the carpet, which then needed a steam clean. That's good as well. He landed yes. on the big cash on. Yes, it's burgery. He landed on the pink carpet, which needed a steam clean. <laughs> this is great. This is the best. <clears throat> Which needed a steam clean. When we get to that line, I think we'll fade it away. We'll go. We landed on the pink carpet, which needed a steam clean. clean. <laughs> <laughs> then, Ross, could you come in through the door and pretend to be the ghost? No, you don't have to do it, just come in. Come in. Is that all right? Yeah. Take the, uh, take the, take the mid job to win. Yeah. You're now Dean, though, you're not dead, so if you like to step, just step outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is this the, the moment door. that you lock the door? Pardon? Is this the moment that you lock the door and then everyone. Well, we might do, I don't know. <laughs> we might do. Uh, I don't know about that. If you so, stand out there and wonder what you've done with your career. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Well, this is so good. <laughs> right then. So. So we should get out of this bit because he's gone out of the room. So we'll carry on from here. They call him Asdi, he calls us a train. It just sounds so good. What a great song! Wow. 
One, two, three, four. They call him I.C. He called himself the king of the swing. He got hit by a bee, which made him permanently treat the French green. I saw it was seen. It landed on the pink carpet, which needed a steam clean. 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 Ah! <laughs> when he comes in, when he comes in, we were amazed. Because he's the ghost of deeds. Come in again. Ross. I and think you should going. do all the song again. Yeah, the whole song again. Yeah. Yes, we're going to do. And then, come in again. Are we still like cream at it? Have you got any? <laughs> 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 I've never lost much on a Friday morning for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's take it, then he comes in. Uh, Ross, I'll give you a secret signal. I'll go, come in! Right, Ross, in a minute, with you in a minute, Ross. With you in a minute. Go on, with you. Now one, two, three, four. They call him Andy. He called himself the king of swing. He got hit by a bee, which made him permanently drink a fresh drink. Oh, so it would seem. He landed on the pink carpet, which needed a steam clean. 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 Ah! It's the ghost of Dean. Step forth, oh ghost of Dean. <laughs> Let's pretend the ghost of Dean only appears every hundred years. Last time it appeared was 1917. It's nearly 20 past seven in the old money. So, <laughs> don't you got that gag? No <laughs> Let's pretend, you don't have to answer, you don't have to answer, or you don't have to say out. Let's pretend that when it appears, there are three questions we must ask the ghost of Dean. Who knows what the first question is? Who are you? Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? The ghost of Dean. That's good. He's speaking rhyme. So we go. We all say together. Go. Where have you been? The ghost of Dean. What have you seen? That's right. Where have you been? The ghost of Dean. And what have you seen? And why is the fresh cream on his jeans? Where the fresh cream on your jeans? Where have you been? The ghost of Dean. What have you seen? Why the fresh cream on jeans? We're doing it really fast. But rhythmically as well. We don't reply. That's four questions in one. No, but that's good. One, two, three, four. Where have you been, the ghost of Dean, and where's the fresh cream on your jeans? Does not reply. That's just the second most important question we must ask of the ghost of Dean. Is this a dream? Is this a dream? Let's ask him that. Is this a dream? You don't reply. <laughs> we'll ask it in a Shakespearean voice. Is this a dream? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like chopping wood, I think. Sounds like chopping wood. <laughs> Is this? I don't know if you took it out of the Is this? I believe! Does not reply. The ghost of Dean! The ghost of Dean! That's right, yes, I know that bit. So, let's ask the third and most important question we must ask if the ghost of Dean has returned to us after 100 years. Why is he walking with a limp? You got gout. That's a good point. So, my argument, you don't reply, but your point. <coughs> that the <coughs> significant mark. <laughs> so we go, why are you walking, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> ah! Why are you walking, Bill? Because of that dint. Because of that dint, yes, it's the dint. I love that word, dint. Round of applause for Ross, he was fantastic. <laughs> I think I often do that, this, this thing with the questions, and it starts to, because what we've got here, what we've got here is this amazing narrative, amazing story. I know it's ridiculous, I know it's that. I know Ryan helped it along, what Ryan really did. It helped us to think about it, it helped us to make a tale. It, it, when I walked in this room, I was a bit kind of oddly subdued about the fact, the fact that it weren't that exciting, this room, but in fact we made something up about it, we made something up about it together, which is fantastic. And to me that's where stories come from, just from ordinary things. <coughs> Not being worried about where the story might go. Accepting everything that everybody says. When I work with people, I've worked in school, I've worked all the place, and people often go, uh, so and so, I'll not give you any good tales. But they do. And I think it's just an idea of accepting 
people's stories, and accepting that we are all, but you won't expect me, we're all people who make tales of So, there'll now be a short period where you can ask me some hard questions, which I'll answer in a humor shaped formative fashion. And hopefully, this morning will be what you wanted it to be. Is that not actually been the kind of thing you wanted? I wasn't sure. You see, I won't. Yeah, people think. So, do we have some questions? I'll, ask, I'll answer them. Have you finished your tea yet? No, I never get to finish the tea. I always talk so much, get the tea, don't finish the tea. I always get the yes. How did you get into public speaking? It was really just, um, I've always been a show off, so I like showing off. And I think showing off is a great thing. And at school, I was good at writing poems, but I'm a bit shy of actually standing up and reading them. But then I discovered that actually I could just make people laugh by doing daft things, and just, just making them laugh and get them on my side by doing that. And then um, I, me and my mate formed a band in Barnsley, Barnsley's first folk rock band, Oscar the Frog. I was the drummer, and we had no, I had no drum set, it was took away. <laughs> and that just got you into it and just played drums. We got some drums later on. And then the idea of actually the bit in between the songs I like best, where I can stand up and start talking to them. That's the bit I like, just the talking. And it, it just came from there, really, from being at school, from being, from always wanting to do that. So when the band split up, me and my mate used to go around folk clubs, because they were the place in those days where you could stand up and perform. And it's just been a thing ever since then. I've always been kind of addicted to it, addicted to this thing of standing up. But it does go back to what I talked about at the start, which is the school I went to in Darfield, just encouraged you to stand up and perform. And you know, it, it, it's, it's a thing about confidence, isn't it? And it's part of the thing that we try and get. <coughs> We are confident people, but a lot of people aren't confident, and I, I just wish more people were. My, my son, uh, when he was at school, went to youth theatre, a lot of youth theatre, standing up in public, you know, and, and not being embarrassed. It's that thing I said at the start, my wife said, she's going to do this job for a gold thing, because there's that idea that if you stand up in public, terrible things are going to happen. In fact, they've all happened to me, and they're not as bad as you think. I always think in geological time, if something is terrible, appalling, I always think, well, it's, it's terrible now, but 100,000 years, who cares? That's the thing, you've got, to, you've got to develop a kind of hard outer carapace, you know, it's more than me, because, you know, sometimes it don't go as well as it has this morning, and then you just got to soldier on. So that's how it started, at school, school, I was all, I've always loved this kind of thing. And sometimes it don't go well, sometimes it does go well. Uh, sometimes it goes fantastically well, like it has this morning, because this, this room just appeared to take on a kind of, partly because of all the laughter, to kind of, kind of strange kind of pressure cooker atmosphere here, but we're in some strange kind of other world. I know we are, we're in Rotherham, we're in some strange other world, which is fantastic. And that's what you try and do in a room, like, which is what I think radio does. It creates magic. It's amazing. I know we can't say the word magic in here, but it creates magic. I can't imagine, as it were. Let's keep asking, keep asking the questions. Yes, sir. How long have you been tweeting your morning walk? Oh, tweeting. I tweet all the time. Anybody that follows me on Twitter, I'm a mad tweeter. I get up every morning. I always woke up early. What my wife calls big time. I wake up every morning. I don't want to. I just wake up early, about half past four. I don't want to. My dad was in the Navy for 20 years. And he always used to, he was on the four hour watch. So he always used to get up four hours after he went to bed. So he drank into bed late. And I think I'm the same. I just wake up. So for a bath, I may as well just lay in bed. But then I, I get up. So I get up. And every morning I walk around Darfield. And I do my morning stroll. And I walk around Darfield. And I tweet what I see. Every morning. It's always the same walk. Unless I have to go out really early. I always do the same walk. Best thing I ever saw was a bloke in a high vis jacket who walked past a bloke in a camouflage jacket and they cancelled each other out. That's what I mean, think. You could actually just make something out of it. You could make something out of it. So and then, interestingly, I met up with this composer in Bristol who said, because I've been writing a couple of operas lately, because I like writing stuff for musicians. And he said, look, we could write something together. I said, well, we could. He said, I could, you, I could turn your morning strolls into a piece for baritone and avant-garde guitar. I said, yes, you can. So we performed it last week, or a week before, at the Harrogate Festival. And that was amazing. Just these ordinary things, me seeing things, has turned into like this, it turned into a piece. So yeah, tweeting's great. I love tweeting. Tweeting makes me think and the actual walking around makes me physically exercise. But just see if I see what I, I mean, today, what did I see today? Today weren't that great, to be honest, but what did I see? Uh, well, look, the best tweeter I think is a guy called Moose Allain. Do you follow Moose? He's great. He's a cartoonist, joker. He did a fantastic one about uh, 
I've got a model of Everest. Is it to scale? No, just to look at. There's stuff like that. Oh, interesting. Gangs. And a fellow called Glennie Rodge. Um, somebody else. They do the very interesting little gangs. Because as you know, tweet, Twitter is just a tiny thing, 140 characters. So, I'll tell you what I saw this morning. It, it wasn't that great, to be honest with you. But, uh, let's have a look. That's me with the, uh, the pointless celebrities trophy. My terrible humiliation. Uh, didn't know any of the members of England football team in 2006. So if I were Jack Butland who had turned out to be 12, and I'm just going to find you what I saw this morning. I, I do, I've tweeted a million times this morning already. Uh, here we are, it's coming, it's coming. Early straw. I always put early straw, then people know what's happening. And that does then make, take a few characters up. A single brown leaf on the path Seems like a message from an ancient autumn. It's weird, it's like summer. We're walking down our path to gate, it's like it's the old leaf. Ah. Then I put light has been hurled at my brother's window, because my brother lives down the street. He let his curtains off. It looked like they were something were broken, like somebody took glass, took light at them. So I did that and then just that kind of thing. Just and tweeting is great for me, it's a great it's another way of telling stories. I tweet all the time. My wife says I'm a bit addicted to it, which I think I am a bit. When I'm on the train, I tweet about people, I tweet about them all the time. I want to explore. You know when people love eating bags of crisps? And the bash bottom of the bag, you get the very last crisp out of the box, sat and he's going like that, he's going like that. So I tweeted, I've never seen a man enjoy a bag of crisps so much. And he tweeted back, he went, I'm enjoying them. <laughs> <laughs> you forget that sometimes people recognize you. Yeah, yeah. You're only going to eat out of following me. Oh, God. That was a bit of a bad one. Man. Yeah. So yeah, I do tweet a lot, and tweeting, Helps me to think and helps us to make stories. But, um, any more questions? Keep them coming, keep them coming. You don't have to if you don't. I guess on, on radio, commercial radio, we have to keep our stories very short. Yes, you do. As you do on Twitter, 140 mm. characters. Do you, yes. Did you find that difficult to start with, getting, with telling a story in a few seconds or a few characters? I find it, I find it easy, to be honest. I find, it, I find the telling the tale in a few characters easier and I think it, it does require more discipline. It requires a lot of discipline. But I remember when I was on Radio Sheffield, it was the same thing, you know, you had to tell the tale very quickly. And it just means you have to get to the tale. And what it means is, you must find this, you get impatient with people who can't tell the tale. You go, they go, and anyway, and then he said to me, you tell the tale, please. <laughs> Tell me the flaming tale, you know. <laughs> but then, Frank, and you know, just tell the tale. And you do get that, so you become a bit impatient. But I think the thing about that is just to, I think using, using real people, using real people's names, real people's names are always <coughs> the best thing, because they never actually believe it's about them. I've found that. Um, reducing it to very specific images, very, like that line that looks like a busted cushion, you know, stuff like that, very specific images. But I do find, so a lot of the tales that we told today, I tell a lot, but then I was excited by making this, which was a short tale. But you're right, it has to be short, it has to be pithy, it has to be real, it has to relate to the people that are listening to it, and we have to know that they might not listen beyond the next, they might be doing something else, they might not hear the next one, so that one has to be self-contained. But she tries sometimes to do stuff that goes over a number of links, or a number of records, but you, you lose it. It's a very interesting, Skill to try and get, I think. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think mm, it's, no. it's, it's, well, it's just things, it's when things happen to you, when interesting things happen to you, you think, how can that make a tale? How can that make a little tiny story? I'm just trying to think of it. recently. Uh, you try and make it into a little tale, then it expands. I was in Portugal last week, <coughs> and this, this bloke, I'm on my holidays, and this bloke come up and stood behind me, he was a Barnsley fan, I didn't know he was, I didn't know him, and he stood behind me and he went, Hey, oh, how's Barnsley gone on? Which is like a phrase that everybody in Barnsley says to each other all the time. And suddenly for that moment, I was out of, ba I was out of Portugal, I was studying Barnsley, and that was like a little thing, so this fellow behind me, Hey, oh, how's Barnsley gone on? It was like that. Another question? I keep doing strange movements, don't I? I don't keep the baby of the question. Uh, who do you like listening to on the radio? Uh, well, I like, in terms of music, 
I'm a big fan of music that empties the room, to be honest with you. I'm a fan of avant-garde music, as my wife calls it, haven't practiced. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, the stuff that sounds like, as they call it, a fire in a pet shop. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I listened to, this is the writing, but... <laughs> I listened to uh, Late Junction on Radio 3, <coughs> plays the most astonishing stuff, really weird, weird. It's on late at night, so I tend to listen to it on catch-up, because you try, they put like half-hour ambient tracks on, and you've gone. <laughs> you sleep. If you listen to it during day, on your stroll, um, I think in terms of broadcasters, I do like the fella who works with Ernie Fenn, Joe. Sentence. I think he's got a great feel for the place, and people people like him. He's, he's on. He's in. You can tell because he's on in taxis. And when taxi drivers listen to him, then they know him, and they call him that jewel, which is like a, a compliment in, because they always say, "I'm going to that London," and that. So they got. They like him, and he, he seems to. He talks directly to people, so I like him a lot. I think Rory Robinson's good on Radio Sheffield, partly because he's been there such a long time. He's interviewed everybody in Sheffield twice. And <laughs> he's interviewed the dads and the granddads, so he, know, he knows them all. And that's the other thing about local radio, as you know, it's about the locality. So I like them. Uh, I, like, I like listening to there's some weird stuff. There's a thing called Resonance FM, which is a weird radio station out of London. It's, on, it's fantastic, if you like the kind of thing that I like. For example, they wired up a bloke playing a saxophone walking through the middle of London. That's 10 hours. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a fire in a series of bass shops. That was great. So I like that. I also like listening to radio drama. There's quite a lot of that on Radio 4. Uh, but the truth with that is, a lot of it's not that great. The ones that aren't that great is when they go, So, Frank, I see you've got a gun in your left hand. And I was like, <laughs> 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 Okay, when they kiss each other, they always kiss each other. It's always real. Nobody's ever yeah. kissed each other. Hello, darling, I'm home. It's just like a fire in a bass shop. Okay? It's all that kind of thing. So, <laughs> well, I listen to radio all the time, podcasts, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, the, the Economist, the Economist magazine just started doing some amazing podcasts, Economist Radio, interesting, makes you think. Uh, they just started one from the Atlantic magazine in America, so I listen to podcasts all the time. I never watch telly, just listen to the radio all the time. I think we're in a good place at radio at the moment, I think radio's doing good, I think a lot of people listen to it, a lot of people like it. Uh, I, I said that because I'm kind of on the inside, I think maybe I would say that anyway, but I think a lot of people like it. Have you heard that fantastic radio thing where the blocks trying to say there's a fire in the Firestone Tire Factory? It's brilliant. Have you ever heard that one? It's an Australian one. Does that thing called Radio Fail? Do you know that? that, that We've all been on it. Yes. <laughs> there's a great one. It's this bloke who's trying to say there's a fire in the Firestone Tire Factory, and he can't say it, he gets really mad. Because he goes, there's been a tire in the fire, and he's Australian, and there's a tire in the fire. There's a time the fight, I can't see. The kids go, ah, Jesus! There's a, they get shouted, there's a time in the fight, no, fantastic. That kind of thing. The worst one of that kind of thing that ever happened to me was at Radio Sheffield, years ago. Me and my mate were doing the mid morning show. It was a presenter called Dinah Maiden did the breakfast show. And so she'd be here, and she put her last disc on, and then the newsman would be here, and then me and Martin would start our show here. And she put the last record on and collapsed. Of a desk and was sick all over the desk like that. And we went, someone took me down and someone took. They went, just carry on, carry on. So then the blog started reading the news. He was sick. What happened was this virus had come in through aircon. And, and it was strange. Then I said to Martin, how do you feel? He said, I feel fine. I said, I do. Then suddenly he collapsed. Then his producer collapsed. And for some reason I didn't get it. So I'm like this. I didn't know what to do because I couldn't, I couldn't drive the desk. We had a blog to drive it for us. So I'm going, Hello, welcome to the Ian and Martin show. It was all here and here. They hear people like collapsing. And then this guest turned up from Conisbury, who made a Conisbury version of Monopoly. And to Wood, and she walked in, and she was a guest, and we played Conisbury Monopoly all morning. That's because this book called uh, Nigel Cade, who used to call him Sir Nigel Wax Jacket. You see, like one of these station controllers that didn't actually know what happened. And he ran in to try and help, and he was sick. Very strange. Very strange. But I'll look at on. BBC Radio Sheffield we used to <coughs> train him from Barnsley, get picked up at Sheffield by the producer Bob Hazelwood, then start show from Radio Car. And one week I said, let's pretend that microphones bust and see what happens. So we set off and I said, hello, it's Ian and Martin. Uh, I'm afraid we can't broadcast here because the microphones bust, so you won't be able to hear us. <laughs> and folks are thinking, we're they're coming through in Drumfield. You'll have it clear in one seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really. So I stopped there.
Can't think of anything else to say. I'm spent. I'll probably fall asleep this afternoon, like you done. Any more questions? We have the formal vote of thanks for the presentation of the small bouquet from the carriage. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining in so well. I mean, sometimes people don't join in, but you join in wonderfully well. And there was, a, like I said before, there was a great sense of joy and hysteria, partly by the fantastic laughter that was in the room. And that was great. We made up this thing. And I hope we just had a, it's made us think. It made us think about stories. I don't know. That's my reading room. Next to me, There we go. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.